Everyone, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Josh. I'm one of your clergy here at St. Nick's. It's great to be speaking to you tonight, kicking off our vision series, digging in uh, a bit deeper together into the theology and practice of generosity. We talk about praying, serving, and giving a lot as a community, right? Can you say it in your sleep? We believe in the evangelization of the nation, the revitalization of the church. You can play a part in three ways, so pray, so give. Um, that is not because we uh, want those things from you, but because that's something we think is really important, something that we want for you. And we talk about it a lot because it tends to be an indication of a heart that is devoted to Jesus, a heart that is outpouring in response to receiving the love of Jesus. And so... Um, Following on from kind of our deep dive over the last few weeks on prayer and what it means to be a community or a disciple that dig deep into all God has for us in prayer, we're going to be carrying on the next few weeks looking at generosity, deepening our posture of generosity together and all that God has for us therein. So today we're going to be looking together at the spiritual practice of generosity its roots, and how Jesus calls us to practice generosity, to have a heart of generosity in every aspect of our lives. To do this, we're going to be unpacking this passage from Luke, describing Jesus' interaction with uh, a woman in the house of Simon the Pharisee from Luke 7, 36 to 50. So um, grab your Bibles. There's Bibles down the front if you want to grab them. It's going to come up on the screen. Look at it on your phone. And maybe when you look at your phone, check to see if I text you about 10 minutes ago during those really interesting notices to see if you'd be on communion team. That'd be great. Thanks, guys. Um, Everyone else, focus in on the passage. So let's read together, starting at verse 36. When one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. A woman in that town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. So she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. As she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him, And what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two people owed money to a certain moneylender. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he forgave the debts of both of them. Now, which one of them will he love more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. Then he turned towards the woman and said to Simon, do you see this woman? I came into your house and you did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven as her great love has shown. But whoever has been forgiven little loves little. Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. The other guests began to say amongst themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? Jesus said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. So what does God say about generosity? Giving, serving, these are all things that we know that we should be involved with as Christians, right? But why? What is that all about? Where does it come from? Why should we do it? Well, the biblical narrative on generosity can arguably be seen to begin with what was known in the Old Testament as the tithe. The people of God who've been chosen and rescued by him are given the law. And the law was to teach them how to live in right relationship with God. How to live in right relationship with the God who made them, loved them, chose them and saved them. And within it, in Leviticus 27.30, we get this. A tithe of everything from the land 
whether grain from the soil or fruit from the trees, belongs to the Lord. It is holy to the Lord. Essentially, we hear that the first 10%, the first 10% of everything belongs to God and should be freely given back to him. And, I mean, that sounds quite legalistic, right? Like a rule or a regulation. It sounds quite precise, maybe quite legalistic. It sounds like it also might work quite well in a farming context. I don't know about you, but I'm not producing much in my garden. Like 10% of like quite a scraggly bit of rosemary, maybe, Lord, if you're interested in that. But I've not got much else to offer in that way. Further to this, the Israelites were given this second command to practice what's called a Sabbath year and a Jubilee year. The Sabbath year was every seven years, and the people were commanded that on the Sabbath year, anyone who'd become a slave, which in that context was mostly to do with economics, when you'd sold all your possessions because you were in poverty and you had nothing else to sell, you would sell yourself into slavery. And the people of God were commanded that every Sabbath year, the seventh year, anyone who had ended up in slavery was to be freed without charge. They were to be freed. And then every seventh Sabbath year was the Jubilee year in which they were to do something really radical. When not only would they practice the, um, the command of the Sabbath year to set all the slaves free, but also all land and possessions would revert back to their original owners. So every 50 years, in an economic structure in which everything was land-based because of subsistence farming, all land would revert back to the family who initially owned it when the land was divided up by the Lord in the beginning. So if people were on hard times, they could sell their land, but knowing that in 50 years it would be back in their family. Essentially, God was calling people to a radical generosity, a way of life that was radically generous, of difference from the world order. A radical equality through generosity that meant that if you were born poor, you wouldn't die poor. Poverty could never become cyclical in the way that we see it. In the practice of the Jubilee year, it couldn't happen. The rich couldn't keep getting richer while the poor kept getting poorer. It would all revert back to equality. Yet the evidence all suggests that the people of God never enacted this command. They never celebrated the Jubilee year. So what is this about? Galatians 3 says this, and it'll come up on the screen. The purpose of the law was to keep a broken people in the way of salvation until Christ, the descendant, came, inheriting the promises and distributing them to us. If such is the case, is the law then an anti-promise? A negation of God's will for us. Not at all. Its purpose was to make obvious to everyone that we are in ourselves out of right relationship with God. And therefore to show us the futility of devising some religious system for getting by our own efforts what we can only get by waiting in faith for God to complete his promise. So we see the law was to show us four things. That God is a generous, abundant God. That we are a naturally ungenerous people called to generosity. But that no amount of generosity can earn us right relationship with God. It is, as Galatians says, futile to think that. So what does this ark show us? It shows us that we aren't bound to generous living to win God's love to make ourselves right or to change anything in this world for the better. God makes the first move every single time. What we see is that generosity doesn't become before grace. Generosity is a response to grace. It says in our passage, her many sins have been forgiven as her great love has shown. Not that her great love earned her forgiveness, but that her great love came as a response to the forgiveness of God's move in her life. Generosity doesn't buy you proximity with Jesus. Generosity is a response to proximity with Jesus. 
Let's look a bit closer at the woman in our passage. This is one of my all-time favorite pieces of scripture on what it looks like to practice the way of Jesus. And it calls me back time and time again because what we see so beautifully is devotion in response to grace. Devotion from the woman in response to the grace she finds in Jesus. This woman is known as a sinner in the city. And in in this context, the public knowledge of her sinfulness undoubtedly tells us that she is a prostitute. And for the holiness-focused Jews of the time, she would have been seen as the lowest of the low, not only because of her immoral trade, but also because she would no doubt fraternize with Gentiles or non-Jews for the purposes of business. So it should seem really shocking, in the context it would have been outrageously shocking, that such a woman should enter the home of a prominent Pharisee like Simon, Someone who was known as one of the religious upstanding leaders of the day and approached Jesus, a religious teacher. But she does. And don't you love how Luke states that like it was totally normal? You know, it would have been like gasps when people read this aloud. But Luke writes it like it's totally normal because she's a broken person and she's looking for Jesus, the friend of broken people. And it gets even more scandalous In Greco-Roman culture, the hair was seen as like a really erotic thing. And considering the fact that the woman would already be viewed as a temptress by the people who were present at this dinner, the fact that she lets down her hair as she approaches Jesus would have been a shocking thing. It's amazing that no one kind of intervened to stop her or remove her. It would have been viewed as like an erotic act especially when she subsequently begins to touch Jesus and to kiss his feet. No self-respecting woman would behave in this way, especially in the presence of the men gathered at this meal who were kind of seen as the religious moral people. But that's the point, isn't it? Extravagant generosity leaves no space for your self-respect. Sacrificial love doesn't have a limit based on what becomes embarrassing. It is brutally raw and without a care for itself. And you know, prostitution was rife in the time of Jesus. And the Greco-Roman world weren't famed for their personal hygiene anyway. So you can imagine that prostitution was even less hygienic again. And it's crude, but it's so relevant. Because that perfume that she outpours on the feet of Jesus would have been used to cover up the smell of her trade. Therefore, in this beautiful act of extravagant giving, she not only is pouring away her worldly possession, but she is outpouring her life and soul before Jesus. She is completely turning her back on her old way of life and completely giving herself over to what Jesus wants for her and is calling her into. She doesn't stash it in case this Jesus thing doesn't pan out and she has to turn back to prostitution. She's encountered Jesus and everything has changed. She is a new creation and she gives it all to run after him. This isn't a 10% mentality. Generosity that is just enough to do the done thing. She has come face to face with Jesus, face to face with her Savior, face to face with the grace and love of Jesus. And so, of course, there is no limit to the outpouring that follows in response. Grace means everything to her, and she outpours everything in response to it. What devotion. I don't know if you have, like, your go-to scent. I'm in, like, this scentless void at the moment where... Um, I've always been a Boss Bottled man, you know? But I recently found out that Hugo Boss was quite a prominent Nazi, so then I had this big conflict about using this scent, and so I haven't bought a replacement bottle, and um, I'm, I'm like in this void. And you know, it saved me an absolute fortune. And that is nothing in comparison to this. The Bible nerds reckon that this bottle of perfume would have cost more than a year's salary for this woman. It would have been one of her only possessions, and she would have used it extremely sparingly. And then she pours the whole thing over the feet of Jesus. It doesn't get more extravagant than that. 
But even further, Luke takes the opportunity to outline here the difference in reaction between his, the host, Simon the Pharisee, who was bound by this strict code of hospitality culturally, and the woman who isn't even supposed to be there. We read in verse 44 to 45, I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Simon, the the religious, good, big moral figure in the community, he's dishonored Jesus as his guest by not fulfilling his role as a host. The woman, on the other hand, has fulfilled it. However, we shouldn't make the mistake of thinking that she's merely done what Simon should have done. Jesus shows this. Custom dictated that he was given some water for his feet and she washes them herself with her tears. Custom dictated he was given a towel to dry them, but she dries them herself with her hair. Custom dictated a single kiss on the cheek or the hand and she lavishes kisses upon his feet. Custom dictated that his head be anointed with household olive oil, and she anoints his feet with the most costly of perfume. All of her actions are done at the feet of Jesus, the seemingly most unclean part of the body, which just shows even more the extreme humility of the act. You see, she didn't just follow the custom for what would be sufficient to honor Jesus. She goes as far as she possibly can in this act of extravagant generosity, devotion in outpouring and sacrificial love. Devotion is her legacy. That is what we are called to this evening. That is what biblical generosity looks like. And it is the natural response to all that Jesus has done for us. She's encountered the grace of Jesus, and her whole mentality has shifted. So that's my first point uh, this evening, that you are free. You are saved by grace and grace alone. And that Christian generosity, disciple generosity, is only ever a response to God's move in our life. Not responding so God moves. If you ever thought you had to buy closeness with Jesus by being generous, you don't. Generosity flows as a response to God's outrageous grace, coming close to us first, pouring out his love upon us, giving us freedom, setting us free. It's not a regulation, but a state of the heart. Sacrificial love outpoured in freedom as a response to who Jesus is, in a response to the earth-shattering, life-changing beautifulness of his love for you, his grace for you, his heart for you. And my second point tonight is that we see in this interaction that biblical generosity flows from humility. You know how people say, like, if I won the lottery, I wouldn't tell anyone, but there would be signs? Like, yeah, no joke, there would be signs. If I won the lottery, which would be pretty amazing because I don't play it, but if I did and I won, it would be pretty epic. There would definitely be signs, right? We, we would still live in South Bristol because, you know, these colors don't run, but there would definitely be signs. Um, you would see on my drive a brand new Triumph Bonneville Speedmaster, probably maybe like three or four, actually, so I can pick the color depending on my mood, you know? And uh, you would smell the sweet smell of a Wagyu tomahawk steak just grilling away on my big green egg as I sit there and sip a Lagavulin 52 year. You know, there would be signs. I've made myself sound like a real highbrow redneck there, haven't I? I don't know about that. Um, There would be signs. And that is essentially because I have a pretty good idea about how to spend money, right? I don't know what your like, list of things is. I'm sure we all have those lists because I like to think that I've got a pretty good idea about how to spend money. If I won the lottery, I'd spend it better than everyone else, right? I obviously think that. But God has been really speaking to me at the moment about humility 
the humility of Jesus, the humility that we're called to as disciples, and what that plays out like. Specifically, I've been feeling really challenged by Philippians 2, and what Paul says there is this. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, any comfort from his love, any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interest or shopping list, but each of you to the interests of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing. By taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. That is the way of Jesus. Although he had every right to cement his place at the top of the cosmic food chain, he chose to humble himself, to make himself nothing. He chose to become obedient. That is the way of his kingdom. The strong become servants. The greatest become the least. The powerful become the humble. That is what Jesus chose to do. And if we believe that Jesus in his humanity was the greatest example of the human experience that there ever was, you know, a human being uncorrupted by sin, a human being the way they were designed to be before sin messed them up. Is it then in humbling ourselves that we find our true selves? In humbling ourselves, we become the most free, the most alive, the most full expression of ourselves and the human that we were made to be. And it begs the question, and this is the question that I can't seem to get away from right now. What if I don't know more than God about the best way to spend my money? What if I don't know more than God about the best way to spend my time? What if I don't know more than God about the best way to use my house, my dinner table, my social calendar? What if I don't know more than God about the best way to present myself to the world? What if I'm being called to humble myself? to trust and obey? And what if that is where I'll be more alive than ever before? I love how we see this from the woman in our passage. She's hit this moment, right? This moment where she acknowledges that she's been calling all the shots about how she spends her life, her money, her time. And it's a complete mess. And she dares to humble herself and to ask the question, What if Jesus has a better way? She gambles it all on the question, what if Jesus has a better way? What if he knows what's best for my life more than I do? And she humbles herself before him and all the others there, surrenders it all to him and his way. And it is one of the most beautiful outpourings that we see in Scripture. Humility and generosity go hand in hand. And they challenge and bless us through every part of our lives. I had this moment recently where one of our friends came to stay with us. Um, and uh, he's one of my oldest friends. And I've, I've tried to like really cultivate this policy with my friends because um, they're, they're all non-Christians. So they're very unused to kind of how we do hospitality. And um, they don't know the Lord. So that's a bit weird to them anyway. And then... Um, we're from Devon, so we don't talk about our feelings. Boys from Devon don't talk about their feelings. So um, we're not very good at that either. So I've tried to really build this policy with them that they can, you can come to our house anytime. You know, I don't, don't, like, let's not do a dinner date in, like, six weeks where we all stand on show. Like, you're my closest and oldest friends. You can come to our house anytime. We might not host you. Like, we might not pull off a six-course dinner. 
although I do back myself. But um, we, won't, we won't do this big thing, but you can come and join us in our life at any time. You are like family to us. And we had this moment the other day where um, one of my friends had had a really, really rough weekend um, kind of in his personal life, and he was in a really low place. Um, And I wasn't actually in Bristol at the time, but then I came back that day, and it was like half nine at night. I just put my son to bed, and I texted him, and I was like, okay, we're home. Um, The boy's asleep. I'm I'm free. Come over. And so he came over, um, and he was in a really bad way, bless him. He arrived at the door with a little overnight bag and a pot noodle. And I was like, throw the pot noodle away and you can come in. Um, we threw the pot noodle away. We cooked some burgers. We chatted for ages that evening. Um, he started falling asleep on the sofa, so I kicked him and sent him upstairs to the guest bedroom. He slept there. Um, he stayed for a few days um, as he kind of got over the shock of what had been going on in his personal life, got some good rest, you know, spent some time with us. And, uh, and then he was going a few days later. And he said to me, the guy I know talks about, we don't talk about our internal worlds. He said, um, thank you so much for having me. Your house feels so full of love. He was like, when I come here, I sleep better than I sleep anywhere else. I can never rest like I rest here. It's so amazing to come and, and be in your home and feel the love and be around your family. I just feel like there's so much love in your house. And I wanted to be like, you're welcome, mate. (laughs) You know, anytime. Um, And at that moment, I felt this little prompt from the Lord. Be like, tell him why. I was like, no, no, Lord, it's not the right time. You know, this isn't the right moment. We've just made like a huge leap relationally. Let's like, let's cash in this win and we'll maybe talk about you a bit more like in another six months. Or, you know, when something else goes wrong. Or let's not do that now. And then that question that I've been saying that keeps challenging me came up again. And I felt the kind of the challenge of like, what if it's not me who knows what's best about this relationship? What if it's not me who knows what's best for my friend? What if it's not me who knows what's best for me? What if Jesus knows better? So I said, it's Jesus, mate. And he was like, what? And I was like, it's Jesus. The reason our house is full of love is because of Jesus. The reason this family exists is because of Jesus. You know, without him, Hannah wouldn't have wanted to marry me. You remember what I used to be like. Um, Without him, we wouldn't have this peaceful, nice home where you feel that sense of love. Because that's the Holy Spirit, you know. Without Jesus, my home would be chaotic. Um, It would be a mess. You wouldn't find any peace when you came here. You wouldn't find good rest. It's all because of Jesus. All this is because of him. And you can have that in your life as well. I'd love to tell you that, you know, there was a drop to your knees moment. I led him to the Lord. I baptized him in the bath. It didn't happen. Um, But it was the best conversation about faith that he and I have ever had, you know, because Jesus does know what's best for my friend. He does know what's best for me. He does know what's best with my generosity. And, and I was basically trying to shortchange Jesus in being like, oh, I'll be generous with my home, but I won't be generous with extending that invitation into who you are because that might be embarrassing for me or I know best. You know, and Jesus just subtly prompted, what, what is that? that question? Do you think, Josh, that you know better than I do about this? So my question is, where might the Lord be calling you this evening to ask that humble question? Maybe it's not me who knows the best way to spend this. My time, my money, my home, my dinner table. Maybe Jesus has a better idea. And finally, this evening, the thing we see in our passage is that practicing generosity is to prophetically declare the abundance of God. In our passage, we don't see Jesus chastise the woman for her generous outpouring or encourage caution with her possession or with her reputation. You know, in one of the other gospel accounts, Judas is there. I don't know if you've got to the end yet, but he turns out to not be a good egg. And he does lay into the woman about like, oh, we should have sold that perfume and given the money to the poor slash pocket it. Um, 
But Jesus doesn't do that. Jesus doesn't tell her. And I believe that that is because in Jesus' life, we constantly see him act out a kingdom mentality on generosity. And it is simply this. God is a good God. A God of abundance. Who made everything and to whom everything belongs. And he doesn't hold out on his children. God is a good God. A God of abundance. Who made everything and to whom everything belongs. And he doesn't hold out on his children. Jesus lived as though he truly believed that promise. He makes it in Matthew 7. He says, if you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? Jesus' mindset of the abundance of God meant that he lived sacrificially and generosity and generously from the stable to the resurrection, even towards his enemies. That's why he said seemingly wild things like sell your possessions and give them to the poor or don't worry about your life. He is inviting us to live by a different story. One where we stand up to and call out the lie that there is not enough for what it is, a lie. The birth, life, death and resurrection of Jesus shows that God turns death to life, evil to good, despair to hope and he can turn scarcity to abundance. When we believe that there is enough, we begin to see opportunities for generosity all around us or opportunities to experience the abundance of God's new kingdom. I think one of the best ways I've ever seen this play out is um, my son is two. And uh, well done. You all came to the evening service. Great decision. But if you, um, if you come to the morning, there's pastries at the morning. Because, you know, everyone's like dragged themselves out of bed and needs some breakfast when they arrive. And um, I was stood at the back once, like panicking, I think, because I was leading the service. And I hadn't really wrapped my head around it yet. And I was frantically reading through the plan on my phone. And uh, my two-year-old came up to me. And he was holding a pastry. And um, I said, oh, that looks good. As he, like, wafted it in front of my face, I smelt it. And my, like, journey from, like, waking up to Sunday morning church just involves, like, a lot of espresso and not a lot else. So um, I, I realized I was really hungry. So I was like, oh, can I have a bit of your pastry? And he said, yeah, you can have all of it. And he gave it to me. And I thought, oh, what a legend. What a generous little man. He must have great parents. Um, it's, not, it's not true. Toddlers are not generous people. I then watched to see what happened next. And what he did is he walked from where I was to the cafe at the back where the pastries was. He, he eyeballed the person behind the cafe. And he said, pastry, please. And they gave him another one. He smiled at it and off he went. One Sunday, I watched him to see what would happen if left to his own devices. And he had eight pastries. You know, he wasn't being generous when he gave it to me. He wasn't like giving away his one pastry. He was just living in the reality that when he's in here, there's no shortage of pastry. They're never going to run out. Yeah, you can have this one. I'll go and get another one. What a beautiful example of what it is to be a child of God. When we believe that there is a good God who has enough, who is abundant and doesn't hold out on his children, we can give away what's in our hand. Sure, God can give me something more. Oh, you need some of my time. Great. God can sort out my time for me. Oh, you need some of my finances. Great. I believe in a God who provides. When we keep our eyes fixed on the God of abundance, we can be generous. Pick up a newspaper And you will see a world screaming that there is not enough. There is not enough land. There is not enough security. There is not enough food. There is not enough water. There is not enough money. There is not enough freedom. To practice generosity is to prophetically declare to a broken and frustrated world that has a mindset of scarcity that leads to violence and disorder, that there is a God of abundance who is for them and has good things for them. So there we have it. 
a potted history of the practice of generosity in the people of God. A prophetic declaration of the abundance of God. A state of the heart born out of humility before the King of Kings that encapsulates all areas of our lives. And a practice that flows from the grace of Jesus as an outpouring of love to the God who runs to meet us with forgiveness and freedom and love before we even know we need it. Let's grow together and be marked as a people who practice generosity in all that we do. And my challenge this evening is to ask of Jesus, where is it you're calling me to grow in my journey of generosity? Should we stand and let's pray and let's ask that of the Lord now. Let's stand together.